The summer of 1985 was a classic, Back to the Future, and the Goonies were what everyone was watching in cinemas. Phil Collins and Huey Lewis tore up the charts, and the likes of Hulk Hogan, Mr. T, Sylvester Stallone, and Madonna were never far away from TV screens. However, in California for once, it wouldn't be tales of megastars and Hollywood that covered the front pages. It would be something entirely opposite. This was the summer of the Night Stalker. Richard Ramirez had been born in El Paso, Texas in 1960. His childhood was filled with physical and mental abuse. Seeking an avenue of escape from his home, he came to idolize his cousin Miguel. Miguel had been a Green Beret in Vietnam and was profoundly disturbed. He would tell the impressionable youngster of how he had raped and slaughtered innocent civilians, mutilating them. He had the pictures to prove it. Women were tied to trees. Photos showed Miguel raping them. One showed him with his penis in the mouth of a severed head. These images were burned into Ramirez's mind, and he was present when Miguel killed his wife, being covered in her blood. Others around him would teach him to spy on women in the nude and break into houses. His cousin had taught him how to hunt prey. In many respects, he had been trained as a serial killer from childhood. These issues were compounded by a slowly developing drug problem, going from glue to marijuana and eventually LSD, PCP, and cocaine. To fund his habit, Richard would engage in burglaries. His housebreaking would escalate to rape in 1978 and finally murder in 1984. Mei Leung was just nine years old. Ramirez and an unidentified accomplice took the girl to a hotel basement in the establishment where he was staying and raped her. Ramirez then stabbed her to death and hung her body from a pipe. It was an easy kill for him and very different from his Night Stalker crimes. Perhaps he wanted to see what killing was like or the young Asian American reminded him of the girls in his cousin's photos. Many of his future victims would be just as defenseless. Now having a taste for blood, he would strike again in June of 1984. This time, Ramirez would utilize the skills he'd been taught, breaking into the home of 79-year-old Jenny Vincow and stabbing her while she slept in bed. He slashed her almost to the point of decapitation. On March 17, 1985, Richard Ramirez's reign of terror would begin after cooling off for almost an entire year. He watched as 22-year-old Maria Hernandez arrived home from work in Rosemead, California. It had been a long day and tired, she just wanted dinner. Opening the garage with a remote and exiting the car, Maria had little time to react before Ramirez strode up to her with his twenty-two handgun drawn. She pleaded for her life as he pointed the weapon inches from her face. Time must have felt eternal before the explosion of noise engulfed the garage. He had shot her in the head. By a miracle, the bullet ricocheted off the keys in her hands as she tried to protect herself, and only wounded in the hand, she played dead. She was too scared to move, and thankfully Ramirez didn't check. He stepped over what he believed to be her body and entered the condo. Inside, her roommate, Dale Yoshi Okazaki, had heard the shot and taken cover behind a counter. Laying in wait, she fatally raised her head to see if the assailant was still there. He shot her dead. On the way out of the condo, a running Hernandez would run right into her assailant. He simply tucked his gun into his pants and strolled away. Not satisfied, Ramirez would travel next to Monterey Park where he dragged Sai Leon Yu out of her own car just an hour later. Like with both other victims that day, he would shoot her once in the head. However, Veronica would have no miracle, and she would be dead on arrival at the local hospital. The day of violence would immediately propel Ramirez into the spotlight. He had been sloppy, leaving behind an ACDC baseball cap at the scene of the first killing and allowing Hernandez to escape being able to give a detailed description to police. Described as curly-haired and with bulging eyes and rotting teeth, Ramirez was being dubbed the The Walk-In Killer and The Valley Intruder across local media. However, the coverage didn't stop him, and just three days later he would abduct and rape a woman before letting her go. On March 27th, he would kill again. Returning to the scene of a previous burglary in Whittier, Ramirez entered the home of Vincent and Maxine Zazara, quickly shooting the sleeping Vincent in the head with the same weapon he'd used previously. He beat and tied up Maxine and demanded valuables from the house, ransacking the room. He was sloppy again, turning his back to Maxine and allowing her to loosen his poorly tied bonds. Maxine grabbed a shotgun that was kept under the bed, but it was not loaded. The attempt at defense enraged Ramirez, and he shot her three times, killing her. But he wasn't done. This audacity could not be allowed without an answer. Taking a knife, he stabbed the body in the face, neck, abdomen, and groin. But his most awful moment was yet to come. 
Taking the knife, he gouged out her eyes, placing them in a jewelry box that he took with him as a hideous trophy. The bodies were discovered by their son the next day. Ramirez, however, now had his M.O. There would be a lull of a month before the next attack, as the police established there was now a serial killer at work. Maybe the media coverage was worrying for Ramirez, or he was concerned for a moment over his own abilities. After all, his disorganized chaos had left evidence at the first crime scene, and police had discovered a footprint at the Zazara house. Equally, he had come incredibly close to being shot dead by Maxine. Perhaps, however, his bloodlust was simply satisfied with the extreme violence done to the Zazaras. On May 14th, he would return to Monterey Park and enter Bill and Lillian Doy's home. Ramirez shot Bill in the head as he tried to reach his own gun, proceeding to severely beat the man. He would then rape the disabled Lillian before ransacking their home. Bill died in hospital. On May 29th, he broke in into the house of Mabel Ma Bell and her sister Florence Nettie Lang. They were aged 83 and 81. Nettie was disabled. Taking a hammer from the kitchen, Ramirez beat both women with it and tied them up. The violence was horrific, and such was the force of the blows that the hammer's handle split. Ramirez still wasn't satisfied and introduced torture into his repertoire, using an electrical cord to administer electric shocks to both defenseless women before raping Lang. Using lipstick, he drew pentagrams on the walls of their bedrooms and the thigh of Mabel. They were found unconscious two days later. Ma Bell didn't survive. The next day, Ramirez broke into the home of Carol Kyle and her 11-year-old son. Believing him a mere burglar, Kyle offered her gold and diamond necklace, but it wasn't enough. Ramirez viciously sodomized her at gunpoint but let her live. The attacks throughout the Los Angeles area began to create panic as the newspapers began to refer to him as the Midnight Stalker, playing on all manner of horror movie tropes. Ramirez almost seemed like a Freddy Krueger or Michael Myers-type character more than a real human being. However, the worst was to come, escalating. The events in the spring of 1985 would be a mere prelude to the rampage that darkened California throughout the summer. After another cooling-off period, the Night Stalker would kill again on July 2nd, beginning two months of ongoing violence. That night he selected a house at random belonging to Mary Louise Cannon, a 75-year-old widow. Breaking in, Ramirez found her asleep in bed and bludgeoned her unconscious with a bedside lamp before stabbing her ten times and slitting her throat, killing her. Three days later, he tried to kill in the exact same way when he broke into a house in Sierra Madre and bludgeoned 16-year-old Whitney Bennett with a tire iron. She'd also been asleep. However, this time he couldn't find a knife and instead tried to strangle Whitney with a telephone cable. As sparks began to shoot off the cord, Ramirez was shocked to see the girl breathing and believed it was divine intervention. Fearing the wrath of God, he fled the house and his victim. Whitney survived the ordeal. His fear of the Almighty didn't seem to last long, however, and on July 7th, he beat Joyce Lucille Nelson to death in her home at Monterey Park. The beating was so brutal that the stalker left a footprint on her face. That same day, he robbed Sophie Dickman, demanding that she swear on Satan there were no more valuables in her house. Attempting to sodomize her, Ramirez failed to maintain an erection and fled the scene. On July 20th, the violence would escalate yet again. Wielding a new machete that he'd bought that same day, the Night Stalker hacked at Maxon and Layla Needing in bed at their Glendale home, finishing them off with gunshots to the head. Not finished, Ramirez continued to hack at the bodies in a frenzy, nearly decapitating Maxon. After quickly selling the stolen goods, the stalker drove to Sun Valley where he broke into yet another house in the early hours. Ramirez shot Chainaron Kovananth in the head as he slept and raped his wife, Samkid. The stalker tied up their eight-year-old son and dragged his mother around the house demanding more loot. Chris and Virginia Peterson would be the next to fall prey to the night stalker, Ramirez entering their home on August 6th. He shot Virginia in the face with a new weapon, a twenty-five semi-automatic and then shot Chris in the neck and turned to flee. However, Chris Peterson was a trucker, and the powerfully built man fought back, avoiding two further shots as he tried to stop Ramirez. The Night Stalker got away, but mercifully both Petersons survived. Two days later, Ramirez would make no mistake. Driving to Diamond Bar, he entered the house of Elias and Sakina Abawath, immediately executing Elias. Undoubtedly fearful of his victims fighting back after what happened at the Peterson house, Ramirez made sure he handcuffed Sakina before beating her, forcing the victim to reveal where valuables were located. Then he brutally raped her. When Sakina's three-year-old son wandered in, 
Ramirez tied him up and raped his mother again. By now, the hunt for the Night Stalker was significant news, and Los Angeles was in a state of terror as the Night Stalker's crimes became more frequent. He had killed at least 12 that police knew of, and the heat was on. Getting cold feet, Ramirez fled the Los Angeles area for San Francisco. Any hopes he may have had of laying low would be eradicated on August 18th when he executed Peter Pan and raped his wife, Barbara. Once done, he shot her. Invalided, Barbara survived the attack, and police quickly linked pentagrams on the wall and fresh footprints to Ramirez. Ballistics from the scene confirmed their suspicions, and panic now gripped another city. In a shocking blunder, current California Senator Dianne Feinstein, then mayor of San Francisco, announced live on television that police had secured footprints from the scene. Knowing he had left other footprints that could be like to him with the same footwear, Ramirez dumped his Avia sneakers over the side of the Golden Gate Bridge that same night. With so many widely differing victims and crime scenes, it took a while for the police to successfully understand that one man was responsible. Even then, with so many locations and departments involved in the hunt, communication often failed. Some precincts didn't want to work with others. Yet, despite the problems, police were now closing in on Ramirez. They got a break when the manager of a flop house in the city reported that a man fitting his description had stayed there, describing him as smelly and with rotten teeth. Checking the room he'd last stayed in, police found a pentagram drawn on the bathroom door. Ramirez had left on August 17th just before the attack on Peter and Barbara Pan. Traveling south to Mission Viejo, Ramirez made an attempt at the home of the Romero family on August 24th. Before he could break in, the family's 13-year-old son, James, heard footsteps outside and alerted his parents. Ramirez fled. Angry, he found the home of Bill Carnes and his fiancée, Inez Erickson. Continuing his tried and tested methodology, he executed Bill and then beat Inez, demanding that she state her love for Satan. He raped her and robbed the house, telling her to let the police know the Night Stalker was here. As he walked away, his victim peered from the window and spotted him entering an orange-colored Toyota station wagon. In a week, Richard Ramirez would be in handcuffs. Inez Erickson gave a detailed description of the attacker to police alongside that of his vehicle. Police also obtaining fresh footprints. Meanwhile, the car that had been utilized was found abandoned on August 28th. Despite attempts he made at cleaning the Toyota, police managed to get a single print from the rear mirror. The Night Stalker finally had a name, Richard Ramirez. Soon enough, police would release a mugshot from one of his many arrests to the media, and the face of the Night Stalker became the most famous in California. In fact, the only person who seemingly didn't know was Ramirez himself. Having taken a day to try and visit his brother in Arizona, he returned to Los Angeles on August 31st, unaware that he was now the most wanted man in the state. He soon found out. Literally, the killer! Ramirez had been spotted right next to a rack of newspapers bearing his own face at a store in East Los Angeles. The stalker fled across the Santa Ana freeway. Without a vehicle, Ramirez was looking for a car to steal as he urgently prowled East Hubbard Street, inexplicably attempting to steal the very noticeable red Mustang of Faustino Pignon. He jumped into the unlocked vehicle and noticed the keys were in the ignition. He didn't suspect this was because the owner was working on the car. Pino was underneath. Rolling out, the owner was incensed that anyone would dare enter his beloved Mustang and promptly grabbed Ramirez around the neck. Shocked, he tried to drive away, but Faustino Pignon would not let go and forced Ramirez to crash into a fence and garage. Pignon pulled the Night Stalker from his car and threw him to the ground. Ramirez knew he had to get away. Running across the street, he noticed 28-year-old Angelina de la Torres getting into her car, punching her in the head through the window and demanding the keys. Instead, she screamed for help and her husband, Manuel, came running from his yard, grabbing a metal fence post as he did. Ramirez tried to make off, but in the meantime, neighbor Jose Burgoyne had called the police, joining the fracas with his two sons, Jamie and Julio. Jamie realized the man's identity. The chase was on, and the group soon caught up with Ramirez, Manuel de la Torres hitting him with the metal post. Desperate for his life, Ramirez kept running, but he was struck again, and Jaime Burgoyne punched him to the ground. The group secured him until the police arrived. Speaking to police while sat on the sidewalk, Ramirez said, I did it, you know. You guys got me, the stalker. Richard Ramirez was charged with 14 murders and 31 other offenses for his crime spree. At his trial, he repeatedly flashed pentagrams that he had drawn on his palms and called out, Hail Satan! 
Outside the courtroom, he had gained something of a female following, with women and girls writing him letters and even visiting him in prison. Many drew the same pentagrams on their hands. Before the trial would conclude, one murder and felony would be stricken. After 137 witness accounts and 5 and 21 exhibits of evidence that included fingerprints, ballistics, and footprints, Ramirez was found guilty on all 43 counts. He received the death penalty but would die in 2013 before it could be carried out. While the crimes of Richard Ramirez would undoubtedly have left an impression on the national psyche at any time, they happened at the perfect point to create a sensation. Coming just as cable TV and rolling news coverage became popular, the Night Stalker killings were hailed as an example of America's moral failings. Metal music took the blame. So did the slasher horror films filling cinemas. Moral crusaders eagerly blaming the media for creating the Night Stalker. Equally, his crimes only added to the satanic panic that scandalized middle America, with countless other innocent parties accused of committing atrocities in the name of Satan in the years to come. Ramirez's crimes would be amongst our worst fears and became the image of the serial killer in the popular consciousness for some time. Hunting at night, he would enter your home like a mystical boogeyman, offering only mayhem and slaughter. He didn't have a type of victim nor a weapon of choice. He could be anyone and could strike any time. Yet he was real and neither a product of our imaginations nor the effects of ACDC or Nightmare on Elm Street. What few wished to admit was that Ramirez was a product of society. One that had produced his cousin Miguel and allowed the mental degeneration of a child so effectively. It is easy to see a parallel between Miguel stalking his prey in Vietnam and Richard stalking his own victims across California. These are the lessons that must be taken from the Night Stalker. Not that we must ban death metal or the trappings of Satanism, nor cower in our beds fearful of monsters in the dark. The lessons must be that we come to understand the profound effects of child abuse on victims, which Ramirez himself once was. It is important to remember that there never needed to be a Night Stalker, with most experts acknowledging that he was a taught psychopath, not a born one. However, any sympathy society may have had for Richard Ramirez was lost in an orgy of blood and violence, and few wished to look further for blame than the self-professed servant of Satan himself.